Welcome to the Columbia University Alilia Bundles Community Scholars Lecture, Showing Up, Unlocking the Superpower of Lived Experiences for Innovation with Bundles Scholar Ken Miles. I'm George Calderaro, Senior Associate Director of Auditing and Community Programs at Columbia School of Professional Studies. We're coming to you from the Forum on Columbia's Manhattanville campus. The Bundles Community Scholars Lecture and Program are presented and administered by the School of Professional Studies and the Office of Government and Community Affairs at Columbia. The Scholars Program was created to enable independent scholars in the community to pursue their academic aspirations through access to Columbia courses and resources. This lecture series was created to provide a forum for scholars to share their work and research. Tonight's Bundle Scholar Lecturer is Ken Miles. Ken is a strategist, producer, and network builder, actively fostering critical connections among people, spaces, and ideas. Ken was born in Harlem and has been a longstanding member of Community Board 9. He is the inaugural executive director of the Penn Center for Inclusion, Innovation, and Technology at the School of Social Policy and Practice at the University of Pennsylvania. Following Ken's lecture, he will take questions from you in the live audience using the microphone right here at the front. So when Ken wraps up, please line up with your, with your questions. Um, and on online, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens, not the chat, please. And you can put those questions in at any time, again, using the Q&A. Uh, the Q&A will be followed by a reception in the upper lobby. A recording of this discussion will be available to view and share on the event page for this, uh, this program on the SPS website next week. Finally, before I turn the mic over to Ken, I'd like to thank him, as well as our partners at the Office of Government and Community Affairs and uh, the forum and my colleagues at SPS, as well as all of you for joining us in person and online. Now, please help me welcome Ken Miles. Good evening. Um, first and foremost, thank you for being here. Um, I'm appreciative of, uh, to the Alelia Bundles Community Scholars Program, uh, which I've had the opportunity to participate in. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all the, uh, some familiar faces, some new faces, uh, what I consider to be neighbors for coming out and uh, coming to listen to this talk. Also, I uh, would like to give a special recognition to CB9, uh, which holds a special place in my heart. And just wanna thank everyone in attendance, also online. So thank you for being here. So the title of this talk, Showing Up, Unlocking the Superpower of Lived Experiences for Innovation. Let's begin. Nothing matters. To say that, so it elicits a lot of feelings, uh, a lot of different responses. But at the end of the day, it's to say that as we process where we are, we're but a speck of dust in the cosmos hurtling through the universe, there will not be a single takeaway. Take the answers you're seeking may not be found. And along the way, challenges and frictions will emerge that may inevitably have you that may inevitably have you question everything you thought you knew. And still, we show up. Show up where we are. Where we are is Harlem, New York City, situated on the Nape land, giving a land acknowledgement because context matters. Currently, I'm delivering this speech at the forum. And actually, uh, if you look outside this window, across the street, that building right there is Prentice Hall. Some may know of it as an art studio, others as an operations hub for Columbia, but it had a past life. In the early 20th century, it actually served as a pasteurized milk factory, a hub for cow's milk.
Now, you probably didn't come here to hear about milk. Today, aisles and aisles of milk varieties, but back in the day, milk was primarily cow's milk. To give context of this space back then, wealthy New Yorkers had West Side homes. These were considered summer homes. Away from the downtown work hubs and meatpacking and garment districts, the city centered its economy around. The meatpacking district cows were also, they were slaughtered, but they were also used for milk. To give that milk a wholesome appearance, folks would add chalk to give it white color and dirt or plaster for thickness, for consistency. As a result, people would get very sick. It actually was a public health crisis. Milkborne diseases led to soaring infant mortality rates. There was a period from 1901 to 1905 where nearly two in every 10 children died before their first birthday. When this happened, it increased demand for what was known as country milk from farms from farther distances, from healthier cows, farms like Sheffield Farms in the Bronx. Columbia actually did an exhibition on this topic. They advertised it, I'm sure, far and wide. But I went on a run one day around the neighborhood and peered through a dingy looking window at a sign around the corner from where I live. I got curious and I walked in. Now, ultimately, country milk shipped in was a bit of a temporary fix. That's because it was still usually transported in open containers. It was an option that perhaps was an improvement on what was happening downtown. But the more sustainable solution was a policy change, which led ultimately to refrigerated train cars and boats along the Hudson right over there that were able to bring in were able to bring in milk from farther distances. Pasteurization, the process of heating milk to kill bacteria, was increased as a result of these efforts. Many white children who were getting sick at the time were being cared for by black women caregivers. It was those same black women who observed the milk was the problem. And they got together with the wives who spoke to their husbands to care enough to do something. My great grandmother, my great great grandmother, her name was Granny Alston, worked as a meat cook in a hotel in Manhattan downtown after traveling up to New York from South Carolina. This was in the early 1900s. I wonder what my great grandmother saw, what her friends saw, and how what they saw shaped how they showed up. What shifted because of it? Being curious about my own surroundings helped unlock a better understanding and deeper context for what's happening around me. If we think of transformation and the transformation of an entire industry, we cannot neglect the observations that contributed to those innovations. As I mentioned before, Community Board 9 holds a special place in my heart. This image that you're looking at, it's, a, it's actually a mural. It's right around the block from here. It's titled Yuri and Malcolm from Harlem with Love. And it sits across the street from the old CB9, Community Board 9 board office, situated between 125th and 126th in Old Broadway, it's a stunning tribute to the bond between Yuri Kuchiyama and Malcolm X. Yuri lived right over there in Manhattanville houses. It's a story about how their advocacy and friendship traveled from Harlem to across the globe. Now, I might not have joined Community Board 9 if it wasn't for my neighbor, Tanya. Rest in peace. See, Tanya, she wasn't able to make a meeting. And to know Tanya is to know she constantly had stoop conversations. I would, I would say her stoop was her podium. 
And one day she asked, she said there was a rumor about something that was happening in the neighborhood and she wanted to find out more about it. The problem was she didn't have the time to show up to the meeting. Tanya worked out of Brooklyn, lived in Harlem. She worked with young black boys who were navigating HIV and AIDS at the time. And so owing to the fact that I had time, I showed up. I showed up to more meetings after that, eventually applying for and joining the community board, initially serving on the Youth Education and Libraries Committee, eventually serving on Economic Development Committee and a few other committees at the time. I also served as a board representative to the 125th Street Business Improvement District. We have an opportunity as community board members to have more direct advocacy alongside our neighbors and on behalf of our neighbors. For those that don't know the boundaries of CB9 from 112th to 155th, from Riverside to Edgecombe. Now, some have claimed community, some have claimed of community boards that power isn't held there. From my experience, I learned greater empathy, learned the power of listening. Also, it taught me that sometimes the most democratic processes aren't inherently the most efficient. What could be more powerful than that? The joy in life isn't simply what you do, but who you get to do it with. You also get exposed to some interesting conversations that shift or reframe how you think about other things. One of those conversations I recall involved a parks department leader who showed up to talk about erosion in Riverside Park uptown. They wanted to, the community board to think about positioning resources from their discretionary budget towards park repairs. One simple question nagged me, why? What possibly accounted for the tremendous degradation at this part of the park? Why did it conveniently happen to be north of 125th Street? That's all great presentation. You know, they had served with the Parks Department and they were now coming as a neighbor. Um, and I just asked why. Ask that question enough times and you kind of get to the heart of it. It turns out that at the time, Robert Moses, the master builder of mid 20th century New York City, serving in multiple roles, as some of you may be familiar with, one of those roles was, was uh, commissioner of the New York City Department of Parks. Turns out, Mr. Moses didn't feel that greater investment was needed above 125th Street, certainly not for its parks, perhaps a belief that the residents wouldn't enjoy them. So the bulk of the budget was spent south of 125th. Now you fast forward a few decades and you have a need for greater investment in parts of New York City, which means more funds are needed to repair someone's ill-informed decision made decades ago. See how that works? Paying for the past decisions of individuals and entities who didn't believe investing equitably was important. It's a lesson and an analogy that is a cornerstone for why advocacy is important. I also wanna acknowledge in this picture, we have the George Bruce Library, which is on 125th. We have the Uptown Market, um, which is under 12th Avenue, right up the street. And I wanna pay homage to Mr. Walter South and April Tyler, two tremendous stewards of Community Board 9 who are no longer with us. Now, the thing about advocacy, it requires a bit of nimbleness. Serving on the Youth Education and Libraries Committee was an amazing way to engage with the institutions 
that shape the lives of young people in our communities. Parents, community education council, superintendents, teachers, program supporters, all the glue that keeps our neighborhoods together. But you see, I wanted to know what shapes deeper connection with the youth who are being shaped by what's happening today. And while we had some youth that would show up, wanted to find out where they were and go to them. So I joined this Arise Summer Youth Program team, eventually going on to lead the program. Arise is a program situated within West Harlem Development Corporation. It's modeled after the Summer Youth Employment Program that's run by the city. They focus on academic enrichment to help kids in the summer, also create exposure opportunities to different activities and to different local community partners. The teens based in West Harlem also receive a stipend for their engagement with the program. Now, the three years I was involved showed me why staying nimble is essential. Those years were 2019, 2020, and 2021. So as you'll see on this kind of chart, you'll see 2019, we ran an in-person program for the teens. 2020, COVID hits, and we transitioned to fully virtual programming due to COVID-19. And ultimately in 2021, we ran the program as a hybrid program, offering in-person and virtual components. Now, that's probably small for you to read, but what that is, that top image with those circles is actually a Gothamist WNYC map of COVID in NYCHA facilities. Right up the block, Grant had one of the highest COVID infection rates. And, you know, it's one thing to read about it, but to live in the neighborhood, ambulances started to sound like white noise machines, you know, between Mount Sinai, between Columbia Presbyterians, just all day. Below is an article, it's a journal article on worldwide increases in adolescent loneliness. And so when we think about what happens when the world shuts down or should shut down and how folks are affected, uh, there are real impacts and there are real consequences around connection. I know uh, Vivek Murthy is currently talking a lot about that as Surgeon General. And that chart over there is a map of, you know, it's a chart of student homelessness in New York City from 2021 to 2022. And when we talk about what's happening in our communities, uh, we really can't neglect the real impact that is being, that's affecting young people as well. Nimbleness needs to happen, you know, when not only in what the country's navigating, but also what these kids their parents and caretakers are navigating. Nimbleness is through program design. Nimbleness is in outreach. I remember Mickey who ran comms at the time. She and I flyered across NYCHA buildings. We took the stairs. We were flying on Pedagua carts just to get the word out because we noticed that people weren't responding to emails as much. They were kind of numb to emails. Along the way, we found a partner in Dr. Sydney Hankerson, then with Columbia's Community Health Center, to incorporate a mental health initiative for teens that summer. Now, these essays that students had submitted talked about some of the stressors of the pandemic. We thought, what does it mean to be responsive to actual community needs? What might it look like if we actually integrated some of these concerns into programming support for that program? So we had supplemental mental health check-in programs that allowed for students to learn practices and approaches, tools for their own well-being. They also got to share and be vulnerable with peers. It offered a glimpse for where they could begin to heal. Nimbleness can meet needs. It can show another way is possible. So I was accepted into the Community Scholars Program in 2019. Shout out to cohort seven. I heard about it through the community board and wanted to apply. I didn't know that much, but I was curious. I also noted that while many worked on deep research projects, particularly book projects, 
You could also explore classes and general areas of interest. So I did. In 2019, I launched Intent Partners. Intent was born out of a desire to connect the dots through intentional strategic partnerships in ways that demonstrate care and work to amplify community. A simple thesis that as the world becomes more complex, translating complexity becomes an even greater priority. You find new ways to center community through arts, culture, media, to make difficult conversations more accessible. Through narrative development, strategic partnerships, community engagement. I recognized in my practice, there were a lot of areas to bring in more lived realities to inform ways that meaningful projects came to life. I call it intent partners because intention is a necessary force for collaboration. And when that collaboration happens in partnership, there's a role for accountability to impact better outcomes. It allowed an opportunity to work with amazing organizations and leaders around brave initiatives with a specific focus on longer term impact and cultural resonance. Now, some of these initiatives that we worked on, on the right is VA for the People. It was a digital zine and community outreach initiative for the 2020 Virginia elections. We partnered with members of Something in the Water and I Am Other festival marketing teams to design a digital zine that incorporated local set lists from young DJs in the community. We interviewed political science leaders at Hampton University uh, to gain perspectives on why voting mattered and have their voice in the digital zine. There were in-person on the ground outreach efforts for communities and families, including food and water distribution conversations and strategies around some of the polling sites in the area. Ben and Jerry's Into the Mix season one podcast on joy and justice. This allowed us to engage artists and other known voices and advocates who were involved in nationwide efforts to infuse justice into how they design different initiatives. Everything from caring about civic engagement to caring about voting rights to arts and activism. Locally, there was a partnership with some uptown friends, a record shop and the Jazz Museum of Harlem when the pandemic broke out to do a food drive for impacted musicians who had lost gig work providing fresh community garden, vegetables, and a supportive resource for musicians looking to reconnect with other musicians. Arts and storytelling move society forward. Projects though, can often be spun up without incorporating local communities. Why? My time in the Community Scholars Program helped me understand ways to be a more supportive and effective bridge across different stakeholders. I sit with this quote a lot. It's by director Raul Peck. Raul says, any historical narrative is a particular bundle of silences. It is an exercise of power that makes some narratives possible and silences others. Our job is to deconstruct these silences. My project, my big idea or pitch for the Community Scholars Program focused on really continuous learning. It evolved into an effort to imagine what kind of think tank could allow us to source insights with local voices to improve classroom academic experiences. My particular conversation was inspired by a conversation I had at Soul Food Restaurant Jacobs. A buddy of mine who born and raised East Harlem convened some friends. I was among them. And there was a range of folks here, a youth basketball coach, a local entrepreneur who had been just disengaged and wanted to build a third space in the community for brainstorming a speakeasy for job or career options after release. 
I thought that idea was brilliant. The same person also knew the number of bills that were passed through Albany in the previous legislative cycle. I remember thinking to myself, I'm pretty sure there are graduate students that don't know that. The classroom experience as an auditor, for any of you that may have audited classes, teaches you to be an observer. Fortunately for me, I failed at this. I believe that lived experiences add layers, that those who are closest to, to the problems are also closest to the mechanisms for improvement. Many of those same individuals are also most invested over the long term. I'll add this quote from an instructor. First, I very much enjoyed and appreciated your presence in the above class this semester. I'm glad you did so much more than observe. You added value and it is much appreciated. Thank you. Do you know why it's the city of brotherly love? To be fair, only recently Googled myself. Apparently because Philadelphia was founded by Quaker William Penn in 1682. The nickname is from the Greek words philos, meaning love, and adelphos, meaning brother. Named it, it was named after these Greek words to symbolize a vision of a city where people of different backgrounds and beliefs could live together in harmony and tolerance. Feels pretty relevant now. So these days, update, I split my time between West Harlem and West Philly. I accepted a role serving as the executive director at the Penn Center for Inclusive Innovation and Technology, which is housed in their School of Social Policy and Practice, better known as SP2. In this role, I work alongside faculty director, Dr. Desmond Patton, who is a social worker, ethical AI researcher, fellow, studying harms online and offline, particularly with a focus on Black communities. By using culturally responsive emerging research practices, his research lab, known as the SAFE Lab, works with youth who are seen as domain experts. And this supports an ability to translate things like social media into accessible, translatable language and insights that add greater context for more ethically informed and contextualized AI and language model development. That lab ties in directly with our center's forward-facing space for practitioners and those who wanna learn more about tools for becoming practitioners in spaces of inclusive innovation and supportive technologies. As a community scholar, I audited Desmond's class, which was on tech and social work, when he was teaching at Columbia University's School of Social Work, alongside Dr. Courtney Cogburn. In this role, I am here to be a bridge, not be bridge. This is the mission of our center. PCIIT advances imaginative and inclusive strategies to improve health and well being across communities by prioritizing trust, care, empathy, and an asset-based lens. We redefine expertise with community perspectives and supportive technologies, centering a more expansive set of voices to shape practices and tools that benefit everyone. With the center and the idea is, with the center, our idea is to reimagine how we redefine expertise. How might we co-design new ways for supportive technologies and initiatives to work better and for more people? How might we question existing expertise that proves time and time again to not reach those stakeholders who are closest to those areas needing to be addressed? Our vision is to expand imaginations, center lived realities as expertise, and discover ways for people to hear themselves better while generating authentic collaborations to inform inclusive innovation. 
There's an urgency to this work. They say when white people catch a cold, black folks catch the flu. And the deployment of tools and technologies without care has arguably gotten us into the crossroads we find ourselves at. So what does better co-design look like with community? How might we better support the expertise that exists? What models allow us to take what exists within spaces of privilege to provide greater choices for our neighbors in the pursuit of opportunities that work for them? Opportunities to gain a network, find career paths, just be curious about an emerging field. Through this effort, we can help redefine what risk looks like and how investment and scalable support finds its way into communities that are hardest impacted. Risk isn't just you taking a chance on an individual. Risk is also what happens if you don't take that chance. We need to more broadly define and unpack the harms and externalities that we all face. And there is no one magical fix. Many of our communities are the epicenter for these conversations. Approaches to something different come from observation and speaking up. Just like those black women caregivers at the turn of the century, how might we build better scaffolds, more imaginative bridges that elevate and help to translate more community-based needs in more sustainable ways? How might spaces and approaches like sustained mutual aid be a framework in our designs to deliver better care? How do we share best practices in ways that ensures efforts are able to continue into the future? It takes the village. So uh, there's an image that I added after the fact. So just picture this. I'll tell the story. When I started in 2019 as a newly minted community, Columbia University community scholar with my new ID, I stumbled on a conference, a climate conference on a topic called managed retreat. Has anyone heard of managed retreat? I curiously walked in and was met with a room of over 100 researchers, organizers, and community leaders addressing a need for co coordinated movement of people and buildings away from risks caused by climate change. There was no consensus on solutions or a central approach on how it should be done. You had Shinnecock tribal members who were teaching the next generation canoe skills refusing to be displaced from ancestral lands as waters rise across Long Island. You had a pair of married researchers who were actually researching out of Marin County, the wealthiest county in the country, by the way, who said despite resources, they still hadn't figured out a way for its main road to stop flooding. What was looming was something money alone couldn't address. Extreme coordination was also needed. So fast forward this year, I was back for a follow-up managed retreat conference. I was there for two days, one of a handful of diverse faces. As I exit the auditorium in Columbia to take a call, I actually passed the coat check and heard a pssst and my name being called. So I turn around and it's my neighbor, David, who's working the event. Now, neighbor means different things to different people, but I mean literal. I'm on the third floor, David's on the fourth floor. So he'd been in that area most of the evening, but he told me he didn't fully understand what was going on inside. So we spoke about the conference and about climate change. And after that conversation, his colleague wanted to learn more about the Community Scholars Program, and she's keeping an eye on applications. Lots of conversations were had that day with lots of global climate leaders and thinkers, but that impromptu meeting, effectively in a coat closet, was by far the most memorable meeting of the day for me. 
through my work and through my projects I am a part of, I remain excited about an opportunity to sit at the nexus of curiosity and community. Without it, we find ourselves in echo chambers of our own design. Intention matters, process matters, relationships matter, grace matters, and accountability matters. If we want to directionally, if we want directionally positive progress to manifest. I've dedicated this presentation and this talk to my friend Michael Ladd, a friend who was always who always showed up to lead with love. And as it relates to this particular community, Michael was part of the team that led the activation for MLK Now at Riverside Church alongside Blackout for Human Rights for several years. I started the conversation by saying nothing matters. Nothing matters. So everything we choose matters. We exist in the universe, which means the universe exists in us. Find meaning and purpose in your pursuit of what can be made possible, even if it's outside your comfort zone. Have that be informed by what you observe. Have that be informed by what you bear witness to. See more, feel more, show up more. It's a superpower. And finally, in closing, three key takeaways. Connection and curiosity are superpowers. Community engagement and advocacy is a foundation. Responsible innovation requires intentional bridge building. And I'm a fan of this notion of two actions in seven days. So things you might want to bookmark. Visit Community Board 9's calendar and learn about the work of the Community Board. On December 21st, the general board meeting is happening right here in this building, the forum. I encourage you to bookmark it. Also, regardless of which community board you show up to, we need to think of Harlem as one community, not necessarily defined by borders, but by understanding and a care for the people who have been here and will be here. There's something that Dominique Jones, a nonprofit leader and former ED of the 145th Street Boys and Girls Club, uh, of Harlem said that stayed with me at a community board meeting. And it was this notion of the web. It's simply that the whole can be greater than the sum of its parts. And when we think about programming, when we think about community-based in initiatives, we tend to focus in silos. And the reality is no one organization can service the needs of all of Manhattan, of all of Harlem particularly these urgent and pressing needs. So if we think of it as a web, then we see the interconnectedness of it all. We see the opportunity of it all to do more, to serve more, to show up more. Thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of questions online and uh, I'm, I'm glad you, um, ended talking about community boards, because the first question, I think it's from a Harlem resident uh, saying, uh, you've served on many committees of community board or community board nine. Thank you for your service. Uh, youth education, libraries, and economic development, among others. Can you talk about community board work in general and what committees were particularly re rewarding or challenging? Thank you for that question. Um, you know, my, my heart is definitely with youth education and libraries. Um, can I talk about the work of the community board um, and what committees were challenging? Was that the framework? Yeah. Um, it's um, particularly rewarding or and or challenging. You can go in either direction. I think that serving on the community board really reminded me and has reminded me um, of, again, our ability to make a difference when we show up. Um, I think it's also 
a tremendous source of, of overall awareness of what's happening at any given time in neighborhoods. Um, you know, a lot of times when you get these bulk um, email attachments, you can kind of roll your eyes at, at the size of, of what's being sent in your inbox. But the reality is it's informative and it allows you to be kind of a messenger and to share out and hopefully with necessary um, networks that you may have, pertinent information, timely information. I think that, you know, the work of being a community board member also kind of is emerging into this critical time of thinking about what do we need for the next iteration of community boards. Um, I think a lot about how much precedent our community boards sit on and, and have access to. There's such a tremendous archive and a wealth of archives. What does it mean to kind of reposition some of that information to be more accessible today? What can we inform in present by kind of being able to more easily access past? I think a lot about um, just the fact that it's a bit of a baton race and our transition and our handoff for the time that we serve is critically important, but that intergenerational element of the community board is critical and it serves a function. And that critical element must also live beyond us as humans of, of, of flesh and of blood, you know, serving alongside incredible individuals who, one of whom was a community scholar, April Tyler, who uh, suddenly departed really underscored a need for us to, to really document and leverage that documentation to empower the board um, more actively as it goes forth um, to make change in the community and across communities. Another question that I believe from uh, the Harlem community, um, if you could please mention some strategic partnerships with the arts. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, um, I think that definitely when it comes to our arts communities, um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of initiatives uh, that are locally rooted. I had mentioned uh, friends who had put up the Yuri and Malcolm um, mural, which sits across from the old CB9 board office. Um, the opportunity exists to kind of connect through lines of whether it's mural arts initiatives or others, you know, arts and culture is a subcommittee of the community board. So, you know, there's constant engagement. There's constantly an opportunity to redefine streetscapes, to reimagine um, kind of the spaces where we gather, you know, we were on Zoom for a very long time during the pandemic. And so to kind of emerge with a desire to engage more, to meet in person, to find those meeting spaces, there's a lot of amazing things and a lot of amazing work that's happening with arts and culture committees across community boards, figuring out ways to kind of activate outdoor spaces, um, to find ways to, you know, whether it's, the bid with the festival, with the 125th Street Holiday Lights Initiative, just thinking about kind of how do we share in this existence as neighbors? And a lot of that comes by being outside, seeing art, sharing experiences around art. So check out your arts and culture subcommittee. That's my plug. Uh, the next question might be coming from somewhere in this building or on campus. Um, the community continues to change. How can Columbia University continue to partner with Community Board 9 to support these changes? And I think you're in a unique position, Ken, to answer this, being both an important part of the Community Board, the community, and Columbia for four, four years, is it? You know, I, I think it, everywhere is, is evolving and changing and shifting. Um, when I think about that relationship and what support looks like, um, I mean, congratulations to the new chair, Victor Edwards of Community Board 9. And as I think about kind of uh, the resources, you know, Victor, when he when he was first vice chair, was advocating uh, 
scouring the community benefits agreement documents and making sure that you know he was pushing uh, for greater support and kind of holding to the letter of the documents in a way that um, made sure that you know the community wasn't missing out on what was potentially uh, contained within. And I think you have these sources of kind of institutional knowledge that exist, um, leverage them um, when it comes to, you know, more broadly how we think about um, the resources that are all around us. You know, I, I find that tapping into, again, intergenerational insights, uh, folks that have previously kind of existed across spaces, both within the community board, but also the university. Um, you know, programming opportunities are always emerging. More folks are using the forum, for example, as a convening space. Um, I feel like I'm, I feel like there's more I can say, but I'm kind of sitting with the, the real insight of, of community board nine is here. Um, it's got amazing folks, some new faces, which is always exciting to see. Um, but the work continues and will continue. Um, so again, cb9m.org, check out the calendar, pull up. A lot of people are, are not sure what they can pull up to, which is interesting. So, you know, minus the executive uh, board meeting, everything's fair game. There's an opportunity to really um, be curious, bounce around, you know, to try a couple committees, see what fits. Um, but I think the other thing that I want to mention is everyone has a lived experience and a lived reality in this room. The thing that you bring to the table and our community boards being able to tap into those insights, whether it be, you know, expertise in public policy, whether it be expertise in product design, like my friend in the back of the room, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to really engage those perspectives to move the needle. Not everyone considers service a long-term thing, to be honest. And, and I think that's real. We have to meet folks where they are, but there's an opportunity to add value in moments. Um, and, so tapping into the experience through the community board, it's necessary uh, to kind of translate what happens across sectors. And now is a crucial time to do that. Uh, the next question is related to what you just said. I think you may have just answered it, but I'll read the question. Uh, I would kindly like to know what quote, centered lived reality that you mentioned is. Thank you. And I think you were just saying one thing you just said was what you bring to the table. So I you, you, listen, lived reality is really just how we show up in our everyday lives. And it's the ways in which we are all curious. We are all kind of, you know, we're, we're trying to find ways to, to tap into what our domain expertise may be. Um, I remember a talk, I, I took a meeting when I was in college with the senior executive. And at the time I had mentioned kind of a throwaway comment, to be honest. I was like, oh, I spent the summer and I was working at McDonald's. Um, full disclosure, I didn't know what an internship was my freshman year of college. And I was thinking of law school opportunities. So April came around and I'm saying, okay, it's time to apply for some internships. Unbeknownst to me, people had applied in November of that year. So opportunities uh, to do that were off the table. So I worked at McDonald's. And I remember sitting um, in this meeting, just having this back and forth. And I learned that 8% at the time of all Americans had worked at McDonald's. And then I learned, um, you know, if it's 10, 15 and you stop serving hash browns at 10 o'clock, you have to look someone in the face and say, I know you see the hash brown over my shoulder, but actually I can't serve that because it's company policy. And the reality is, you know, that's negotiation, right? That's communication. You know, all of these ways that we have lived experiences in the world that we sometimes take for granted. And sometimes it takes kind of 
engaging with different audiences to tap into those understandings in different ways um, to really highlight the ways everything we do um, is a transferable skill in many ways. We just don't always have uh, the language to define it as such. And the clearer we are with our definition of that and the clearer folks can become with an understanding and not just, a, not just that being said to you, but also you internalizing that, then I think uh, the more transformative it becomes in how we walk in our shoes and every day um, with those insights. Well, uh, we don't have any more questions. So on behalf of the live audience and the virtual audience, thank you for this. Thank you for your service on the community board and best wishes as the inaugural uh, director of the Penn Center for Inclusive Innovation and Technology Camp. Thank you.